make his presentation on timing in the optical domain. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Good. Um, what um, I've been playing with, and it literally is playing, it hasn't been uh, totally successful uh, for the past uh, couple of months, primarily since uh, we've come back from Argentina where I talked to some people down there about this, is uh, timing. Do I need to be in the camera? Okay. Uh, timing has been done by us uh, prim primarily in the, in the past few years in the, in the video domain. In other words, we in, in insert the, the time information after we get the signal from the video cameras. It's an electronic uh, injection into the, into the video. Uh, in the old days, people used to use audio and do all sorts of other things. Uh, but we're going to do things a little differently here. And my uh, object was to put uh, uh, the time right into the image that the camera is looking at, at the same time that it's looking at your uh, stars up in the sky, we're going to insert the time there. But uh, Ted, if you could go ahead, let's see what the first slide looks like. So we're putting it into the optical path in the same in, uh, image uh, as the object being recorded. And the purpose here is that you'll see the actual time, if that time can be projected accurately, uh, as the event. So there's no uh, worries about uh, correcting for the camera delays and uh, issues about integration and, and so forth. Uh, the time you see is actually the time of the event. And so the purpose of this is to, to simplify uh, part of that data reduction. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. And of course, it uh, ideally it could work for any kind of camera. Um, it'll work with video cameras. It'll work with uh, uh, astral imaging kinds of cameras. It'll work with the DSLR or the new mirrorless type of uh, uh, consumer camera. But as I'll show you, in practice, it's not s quite so straightforward. Um, and we've done this before. I don't know if uh, you were around when uh, uh, Frank Suits was doing some of this, maybe five years ago or something like that. He would put a, put a pulse per second uh, output from uh, a GPS receiver. I think he was using either a, a Kiwi box or the IOTA VTI, that little uh, flashing LED. He would put that in the light path of his telescope and it would flash the seconds for him. Uh, I think he was using a camera that didn't have a, a video output, which is why he did this. It was a very precise time, uh, but you only saw the, the, that light flash once per second, not in every frame, and only the seconds were blinked. And there was no other time information. He had no idea what a minute you were in, and uh, the other problem is that the, these unfocused blinks in your uh, image, of course, raised the noise floor, and it made your uh, your data less clean. Okay. So the goals here are these primarily: uh, to display the time in the image. I want it to be a DIY capable, so any anybody could sort of make one of these and do it relatively easily and cheaply, and also cheaply so that they could be uh, <coughs> deployed on multiple telescopes in, a, in an array. Uh, and I wanted the, the, it to be reliable, accurate, convenient, and so forth. Yes, sir. So we're going to base things on the Arduino uh, microcontroller. Uh, these are inexpensive, they're easy to program, they use a uh, uh, C++ plus primarily as their programming language. Uh, they work in 12 volts so you can plug them into the same electrical system that powers your camera. Uh, they're small simple processors uh, and so they only do one thing at a time but they do it very quickly so the, uh, there are essentially no time delays in what I'm talking about at all. And uh, they're very easy to interface with the uh, GPS and with the displays I'm going to talk about. Yes. Uh, and the Arduino can be any standard UNO model. Uh, these go for, if you pay the, the retail price, they cost about $35, something like that. Uh, I, I buy mine at the local uh, university. They hand these out to kids who, who have programmed them in the, their science courses. Uh, but you can use these Chinese clones, like uh, were mentioned earlier today. Uh, I've been successful with the ones I've used. They work fine, and what we're doing with them is very simple, so they don't have to work terribly well. As long as they work, they'll work. Uh, the GPS receivers uh, are also uh, in the neighborhood of $30, $35. Um, 
they have to have these outputs, or these the, the 5 volt and ground inputs, of course, but uh, as long as they have a, an RX, a TX, and a PPS line to send data to the, to, to the computer, they'll work for us. So they don't need anything special. And I'll show you the displays that we'll be using. So here's an Arduino board. Uh, it's about the size of a credit card. It's a centimeter thick. Next. This is the GPS board I've been using. This is uh, uh, sold by Adafruit, which is one of the more respectable uh, purveyors of this uh, technology. It uses the same GPS chip. You see it there at the right. I'm uh, sorry, the left. Uh, it's the same one that's used in the IOTA BTI. It's a very reliable chip. It's very accurate. Very precise. Uh, this board is a little fancy. It's got a, uh, a uh, an SD card slot at the top, so you can actually log your uh, your times. Uh, and it's got this uh, area on the on the right there for for making things, uh, you know, customized uh, pieces of hardware. It's a battery backup, as you see in the lower left there. Next, Ted. Uh, this is a smaller version of the same thing. It's got everything you need without some of that extra stuff. It also has a battery backup. It's on the bottom of this little board. But if you look carefully, you can see that it has these. Uh, the TX and PPS uh, output lines, and those are the ones we will be using to read by the computer. And these are the various displays I'll be talking about. Uh, on the bottom you see an, uh, an ordinary uh, eight-digit, seven-segment display. On the upper right you'll see an 8x8, 64-bit uh, LED array. On the upper left is an OLED array. This is a uh, 64 by 128 LEDs, pixels. So it's about uh, 8,000 pixels on that whole screen. Quite a, quite a fine pitch. And then a single LED, and just for uh, extra credit, we'll do a, a piezo buzzer on the lower left there, too. Go ahead. So what the software does, oh, I, I'll bet you all my slides are going to be messed up like this that it'll read the NMEA data from the GPS receiver. Uh, that stands for the uh, Nautical, uh, I'm sorry, National M Maritime Equipment Association. And uh, they standardize the output uh, data streams from these GPS receivers. Um, so the, the software will read uh, the sentences that are devoted to time and location too. It can actually display the longitude and latitude, but we won't talk about that today. And it parses that time, or those sentences, into hours, minutes, and seconds. And at the PPS, when the PPS is received from that receiver, it displays those. And it does that in an instant, much less than a millisecond. It's very precise. And then the uh, Arduino itself has a timer, onboard timer. And we use that to count the subseconds, because we want to have a subsecond precision for the time we display. And we use these libraries. Arduino is a very big community of, of users and programmers, and they've developed these libraries that uh, make the, the processor very easy to interface. And so we use this thing called Tiny GPS to listen to the NEMA sentences and uh, LED control to send the data to, to the LED arrays, uh, and so forth. There's a couple of those. Next. Okay, so first we'll try seven segment displays. Uh, we'll play, uh, we'll, we'll show hours, minutes, seconds, and then hundredths of a second. Uh, the following picture shows uh, the output time on the display as imaged by a Watec 120 and plus uh, using no integration. And by looking at the Gerard Dongle's uh, correction uh, pages, we see that the uh, Watex time, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Kiwi's time as uh, sent out by the Watex has to be corrected by 0 0.033 seconds, and you'll see that in a second. Yes? So these are two fields from one frame. Uh, at the top you'll see what the Arduino is displaying through that uh, eight-digit display. And just below that, you'll see what the Kiwi time is. And when you uh, look at the top and the bottom, you'll see that the, the top one ends in um, 0 0.81 seconds, and the bottom one is 83 seconds, so the average is 82. 
And when you subtract from, what's that time? 0 0.033 from 0 0.85, you'll get that time that uh, is shown in the display, which tells us that the, the display is showing the correct time. Okay, next. And now we'll integrate. We'll, we'll set the Wattec for four, grains, uh, four frames integration and see what it looks like. And this shows the problem with uh, using digits like this. Uh, instead of showing separate numbers for those sub-second uh, milliseconds, or those hundreds of a second rather, they all look like eights because all the digits are run together. So digits like this aren't very useful for showing sub-second precision. Next. So what you do then is you put this into a, a matrix and then you light individual LEDs for the sub-second intervals. So uh, if you have enough LEDs, you can show a hundred of them or uh, whatever, however, however many LEDs you have. So I've been using uh, either the tiny OLED display or the larger 64 uh, count uh, LED display. And you'll see what those look like. Ten. And this is what I had in mind. Uh, this is how I wanted it to look originally. When I was thinking about what an optically inserted time would look like, this is sort of what I wanted. I wanted to see the time, and then below it, a scant set of LEDs. Uh, in this case, there are 64 of them that show the sub-second time. See? And you can see exactly how precise this is. This is using a, a, a PC-164, which doesn't require any time correction. And you'll see at the, at the top it's showing uh, 29.999 seconds, and at the bottom it shows 30.0 seconds. Oh no, it's in that interval between 999 and, and 16. So anyway, you see that the, at the top <coughs> uh, image the display is at the end of its travel, and at the bottom it's at the beginning of its travel. So there's an exact car, uh, correspondence between uh, the Kiwi time and the uh, display time as shown by the Arduino system. So, next. Uh, this is using the coarser uh, 8x8 LED display and this time we're going to uh, show the the uh, hours, minutes and seconds in a different format. We're going to use a BCD format and I'll show you what that looks like. The uh, We'll go ahead and start the, the next slide. Okay. So on the left there, uh, the, the leftmost co three columns show the hours, minutes, and seconds in BCD. I don't know if you know what BCD is, but it's, a, it's like binary code, except it only goes up to 10 instead of to 16. So the top four LEDs show the tens of hours, and the bottom four LEDs show the, the unit hours. So you can see that left column shows one, and the bottom one shows a four, and a 1, which is 5. The next one in shows uh, a 2 and a 1, so that must be 30, the 0 at the bottom, and then the 1 on the, the third column in shows a 3 and a 9, do I have that right? Oh, a 2 and a 9, right? Yeah, 2 and a 9, so uh, 153029 are the numbers shown by those columns, the leftmost three columns. And the rightmost five columns are sequenced LEDs. They're lit up, lit up one at a time, and that's so they won't overlap, right? And we have a precision of a 40th of a second with each one. So as it scans going from one second to the next, those uh, columns on the right will flash a sequential series of LEDs. You can see the, the two fields separated by a small amount here. Let's look at the next one. And here's what integrated time looks like. Uh, the left columns, the left three columns, show the hours, minutes, and seconds. And the, uh, the sequence LEDs now show an interval that's lighted up. And that's because this is a four-frame integration. So by interpreting this, you can tell uh, from the midpoint of that uh, sequence, you can tell exactly what the center of that integration interval is and you can see what the endpoints are, and the range of those lighted LEDs tells you exactly what the precision of that estimate is. So uh, it corresponds exactly to Gerhardt's uh, uh, web pages, um, and it just works. It's very nice and clean. 
Okay, so again, it's a messy slide. Uh, that was the electronics, and those are pretty straightforward. It's easy to program. It's very reliable. Uh, now, the hard part is the optical part. Okay, you have to get this uh, inserted into the optical path so that your camera, your main camera, is imaging this stuff. At first, I tried this just by putting another uh, a telescope, a, a collimator, uh, facing my main telescope. And this was imaging the... Uh, the display so that the telescope could focus on it. Uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, what this looks like in a second. But this, this uh, little formula at the, at the bottom here is, is, is quite problematic because the image size that's produced on the camera sensor is equal to the display size times the telescope focal length divided by the collimator focal length. And because our cameras have very small sensors, the part of that sensor you can devote to showing the time has to be even smaller than that. And because our telescopes have rather long focal lengths, it turns out you need a really long focal length collimator to, to, to get this into the, into the camera image. So, say, go ahead. But I did it, and this is what I had in mind. Again, this uses a, a BCD uh, code. So on the left, you can see three columns that show hours, minutes, and seconds. And I drew a little axes there, X and Y axes, to let you locate the, uh, the LED that moves, okay, the sequential LEDs. And right next to the axis, just to the left of the axis, you can see uh, uh, a couple of more pixels laid up. That's the actual number of satellites that the GPS receiver is looking at to give you an idea of how, uh, how confident you can be that it's getting good times. But anyway, uh, you can see the uh, LEDs. They start in the lower left, and they sequentially light up one at a time until you get to the upper right and then they start over again. 64 of them for every second. And they correspond perfectly again with the, uh, the times that are displayed in the VTI, the Kiwi VTI in this case. Okay. Now this is what it looks like. Go ahead. So here's a small refractor. My collimator is lying in front of it on the floor. There's a, a a Canon mirrorless camera imaging this. The Arduino is on the right there. It's sending the uh, electronic signals into my little OLED display. So the Arduino is lighting up the OLED display with that little uh, uh, display that we just looked at. It's creating an image for the telescope to look at. right? And this works exactly like a, uh, a Telrad uh, finder. Okay, Telrad works exactly like this. It creates a little image up in the sky that you look at. In this case, the Telrad is that collimator, that black thing, and uh, the image is created by my little OLED that's showing the time. Okay, next. And this is that same so collimator inside a uh, an 8 inch uh, Dobsonian telescope, showing how it might be positioned there. The Arduino is just dangling at the bottom there. I told you, I'm just playing with this. It's, it's all play. And this is the image created by that. So it works very nicely. Uh, you can tell the time. I won't bother to decode it here. But you can tell how how long it took that, uh, that camera to make that image. Yes, correct. Yeah. That's the scanned LEDs. Each around is only on for a 64th of a second. So if you add all those up, that's how long that exposure is and exactly when it is and what the precision of that exposure is. So it's very directly uh, communicative. Yep. Uh, so obviously this is quite clumsy, okay? Uh, you can't just put a, a big collimator like that. And that's actually a, a rather complicated instrument. It's got a lens, it's got a Barlow lens because I needed this enormous focal length. And then you have to focus it and position it in the right place. And it's not easy to do at all. So I consider this sort of a dead end, this particular approach. Uh, but uh, I, it occurs to me that you could uh, use an off-axis guider uh, backwards to do the same thing. And this, the next picture has a uh, sort of a generic, this is an off-axis guider, and you've seen these. They take your uh, image of a, uh, an off-axis star and sends it to another camera so that you can guide with it, uh, so that you can make nice long astral pictures, uh, exposures. What I would do is just operate that backwards instead of that prism accepting light from the front of the telescope. It would send light to the back to where the camera sensor is. 
but I'd have uh, my focused image of the time information going back toward the camera. And I think that would work. Actually, I think that would be very nice if you could make that work. Next. But I haven't done that. Yeah, it requires, then now it's no longer in the do-yourself uh, area so much because it requires a little bit of effort, and perhaps machining, I don't know. But then it occurred to me, since we now know BCD codes, we could uh, apply those to the telescope sequentially. Uh, a BCD uh, can be uh, in indicated by a single LED, you know, showing that code in a sequence. If you put the LED behind a pinhole, you now have a very, very tiny display, right? And so you don't need a very long focal length collimator to image that onto the onto the camera sensor. If you understand, remember that little equation before that showed you you need a really long focal length. If the image is small, the display is small, you don't need such a massively long focal length in your collimator to do this. You can do it with a very short focal length. So I did this just for fun. Go ahead. So instead of that collimator imaging that OLED display in the back, I just had an image, a tiny pinhole that was illuminated by a single LED that turned on and off in a BCD code. And I took time to uh, to run that code into the camera. So at the top you see the LED is off, at the bottom the LED is on. And here's that 0.033 delay, you can see that. Next. Oh yeah, here's a Tanger light curve. Good. So I told uh, the Arduino at uh, 20 minutes before the, or t sorry, 20 seconds before the minute mark, start coding uh, what that minute mark will be in a, using a BCD code. And this is like three minutes worth. Go ahead, Ted, next. And here's one of these uh, magnified. So at the left here, you see these, uh, there are eight uh, blinks followed by a gap, and another eight blinks, and then another uh, blink. The first uh, set of eight indicates the hours. The leftmost uh, are the tens of hours, and the rightmost four digits are the unit hours. So it'll show zero, two. If you see the two bit is lit up on the right, you see it? So we have uh, the first four uh, blinks are zeros, and the second four blinks are two zeros, and then a one, and then a zero. That's what we're looking at, so it's coded. On the right you'll see a, a similar uh, number, that looks like, uh, it looks like a ten at the right. So it's zero, 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 one, so the tens minute of the minutes is a one followed by four uh, zeros which is a zero okay so that tells me at the blink it will be two hours ten minutes coordinated universal time okay and there's there's that blink on the right and that's precise to you know much better than a millisecond next so that was with a focused uh, Pinhole, but again, oh, well, I want to show you what a, a integrated one looks like. Go ahead, show that one. Even when you have an integrated uh, interval, it's still usable. You see, these uh, pips, the zeros and the ones, have different heights now, but you can still look at it and figure it out. So it's very usable even with integrated times. Yes, next. But uh, focusing on a pinhole is still difficult. You still need a collimator in front of the telescope and so forth, or, or you have to build a, a backward focusing uh, uh, off-axis guider. So I thought of going back to an unfocused LED in front of the telescope, in other words, illuminating the background light instead of uh, with an artificial star. Uh, and again, showing a BC uh, BCD code to show time. Go ahead. But, uh, as uh, we mentioned before, flashing an unfocused LED in front of the telescope throws a lot of un uh, noise into the background which we don't want. So the, f the solution to that is simply to flash that code only on demand, only when you need it. So just like uh, uh, 
what is it? Uh, flash, that flash thing that uses flash tag. Right, just like flash tag, you flash the, uh, the, the, the flash before your occultation and again after your occultation. You interpolate between the two of them. This is sort of what we're doing here. So let's see what that looks like then. Oh, that's okay. Go back a few. So, this is a, an actual star field. This is, a, in fact, the uh, MU69 star field that we looked at on uh, July 17th in Argentina. And I like the, it has a double A uh, asterism that I like. Anyway, this is a conventional uh, uh, IOTA VTI uh, time sequence. Uh, go ahead. And here's the light curve. I just look at those two stars. And you know, it's, it was low on the horizon, it's a little bit noisy, it's a little wobbly. It has an interesting spike in the middle. You'll never guess what that is. It's an actual occultation. It just happened to be an accidental occultation by some unidentified flying object. Go ahead. So Mark has to travel halfway around the world, you know, with a massive crew and he doesn't get any occultation. I can just sit up in my backyard and I see this UFO passing right in front of my guide star. And it's, it's a perfect document. You can tell it's a, a real UFO. It's cigar shaped. Yeah. It's traveling at an enormous speed, you know. Obviously built by a highly advanced and intelligent species. <laughs> but anyway, I made use of that. I said, okay, let's time that. So, uh, go to the next frame. So, uh, before you saw the light curves, right, the yellow and the blue streaks, they were sort of noisy. Well, in uh, Tangra, you can also ask it to display only the background. Remember, with our LED, we're just lighting up the background. That's what this is. So, you'll see uh, at the beginning, we requested the BCD code. I pushed the button and said, okay, send me the BCD codes for the next minute, Mark. And it has that. That's on the left. And then automatically, it flashes every minute after that. And that's only a 10 millisecond blink. Okay, it's very, very brief. So essentially you're adding no noise to your recording, right? Because that, that BCD information on the left is only displayed when you want it, when you ask for it. And those minute marks are very, very tiny, and so they add an, an insignificant amount. And the odds of your one of your events, a, a D or an R happening during one of those is very small. Anyway, let's blow that up, see what it looks like. Next. And here it is. And again, you see uh, the information is shown in the BCD code. So this is uh, let's see. Looks like one. Oh, and I purposely left out the times on the bottom here. I only show the frame numbers. I mean, before it was easy to tell what the BCD codes were because you could read it at the bottom from the VCI, but I turned them into frame numbers here. So you can tell that the, 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 the BCD code is one hour, uh, 43. So 143 is the time of the next minute flash. The first Nobody, minute of the day everybody see that? So that means 143. So you have unit hours, uh, hours on the left, tens of hours on the left side of the left. Unit hours on the right, on the right, uh, set of eight, the unit minutes on the right, the tens of minutes the right. with the second run score. And of course you can see the, the minute mark right after that. So now Brett Gardner, who's got a couple of hits anyway, the, the time is right there. Next. And here is that little minute mark. We know the time of that, it was exactly 1.43. Uh, UT. I want to there. And you can count if an event happens before or after that. You just count the frames or fields if it happens to be showing fields. So let's go down and see when that UFO hit. You can see the UFO. I have it at 144.57.26. And then you, you just read that. You don't have to you know, go to any uh, tables and figure out what your camera delays are. Uh, you can also replace the LED with a piezo buzzer. 
uh, and that works well with the, the modern you know, points and shoot cameras and uh, better cameras that have microphones. So it's adding in noise to the background, it just adds noise to the air around you. So you can have the VCD uh, time every minute and also have the QPS. So it's just like going back to WWD, when you're listening to WWD, except this time all the information is in the, the video record or the camera record. <laughs> That's all I have. Uh, I think we met most of the goal criteria. What we ended up with, with this little system at the end here, just a simple Arduino and an LED. You combine Arduino for 30 bucks, and I think for less than 50 bucks you can get name brand equipment. You know, if you want to go for Chinese uh, copies, you can probably get a set of this stuff for 10, 15 dollars. So you can get purple.